Hey everybody, Chris Lindsay here, and you're listening to Pitch List. Join us on a deep dive into the heart of what makes writing songs and making music so magical. Let's find out what makes songwriters tick, and along the way, remember why we love music. Welcome to Pitch List. Our guest today has carried country music all over the world. He and his band are the kind of ambassadors this town needs. Down to earth, sweet to a fault, all the while still capable of an all-American whiskey-laden sucker punch when needed. He moves effortlessly between Rolling Stone magazine darling and well-rewarded music row craftsman. No small feat. He's had countless country cuts, and he and his band continue to crank out fantastic country rock records. The last, in my humble opinion, the best, called Tabasco and Sweet Tea. Here's Jaron Johnson. Good morning. we got another fantastic show for season four of Pitch List. I'm so excited to have our next guest. We were doing a little chatting before. We uh, we were talking about the first time we ever wrote. Um, I'm so excited excited to have this guy on great writer great artist jaron johnson how are you man i'm good man hanging in there quarantine quarantine you gotta love it are you um are you writing as much during the quarantine i mean it's been pretty much every day um like on the zoom you know um, yeah. how is but, that for you well i mean i you know we're going on about a year now realistically talking about when I first started zooming, I guess so it would be like March, you know, beginning of March last year. And at the beginning it was a little weird. And then I felt like I hit like a really cool sweet spot. And it was cause you're getting with the artist mm-hmm. that you probably wouldn't have been able to get them to come over to the house. Cause you know, country stars are weird and they don't want to leave Georgia or they don't, you know what I mean? Sure. <laughs> it's a little easier to get them on the zoom. And then in the room. And so uh, it was kind of cool and I've, I've enjoyed it. And it's a whole different process. I think, you know, I feel like I'm able to kind of keep the momentum going while I also sit here and think about the song while I'm making a track or whatever. It's, it's kind of neat, you know? Yeah. And your tracks are so great. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah. Do you kind of work on the track and then send them little MP3s while you're writing? Sometimes it's, you know, you know how it goes, man. It's different every time. If I, yeah. if something like if I'm in there with Tom or, you know what I mean? Or, mm-hmm. so, you know, somebody like that, we're, we'll probably just hone in on whatever it is. And half the time you get done with the song on zoom, nobody in the zoom, when they get off, they have no idea what the hell this thing is going to sound like, because you really spent three hours sitting there going, this is the lyric. And maybe I'll sing it like this, or you play a G chord with a whatever. Um, so it's, it's, that's, that's the most bizarre thing I think about writing on zoom is when everybody gets the demo, they're super excited or dis- <laughs> disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause it's kind of an unknown what it's going to actually sound like. Well, keep, keep them with that theme. I was curious. I, I wrote up some questions. Um, we got, I'm going to kind of handle your interview today in two parts because when I first encountered you, it was as a Nashville songwriter, which you obviously are. I mean, you're award-winning, you know, killer country and rock songwriter in addition you have cadillac three which is just this incredible band too um how much of your time how do, how do you split those two things do you have like are they are they separated for you or are they all kind of mashed together how does that work well these days it's very separated because we can't, we can't go do anything really so it's, right you know That's like right. the band the band since um last march you know i think i got home february whatever we flew home immediately from europe when um the, all the shit hit the fan so to speak you know right and um got home and you know we did a couple of live streams we put out another record a funk record and um well i'd say funk record it's the hillbilly funk record um in october i believe but we haven't as far as like playing and everything we haven't really done much because it's you know it's it's tough out there i don't want to we don't want to be the people adding to the the craziest you know out there so sure um but to answer your question it's you know in a normal year it's 50 50 man you know like because you know I, I have a studio on the bus 
And so we'll go out and I'll be riding during the day. Uh, we'll take riders out with us, you know, or I'm producing on the back of the bus or whatever it is. Um, and then, you know, you play at night because on the road and all you do is hurry up and wait. You know, you're just yeah. like, okay, is it, yeah. is it eight o'clock? Can I start drinking yet? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like that kind of thing. Well, that's great. So you're kind of going full blast at both of them. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty even thing, um, you know, and it, it's really fun because I get to, you know, kind of creatively express myself in two complete different ways um, that the band lets me go be this guy. Mm -hmm. And writing lets me go get out of that headspace and not try to be too cool for school and just write what I want to write. And, you know, if I want to sing it, I'll sing it. But if I don't want to sing it, maybe McGraw will, maybe, you know, you know, you know, that, right. that kind of, that kind of thing. So it's a lot, it's a, it's kind of a, a really nice sweet spot for, for me to be in. I, I feel like. Do you feel that um, because of your success as a, pure songwriter does it give you the freedom to make cadillac three more adventurous or maybe you don't worry as much about country radio per se and i've always thought it would in your situation it would it could make it easier to really go for it you know with your band yeah yeah i think it it definitely gave me a little bit of freedom to i was in a pretty terrible position or situation actually the first time i met you I went over to your house and Keith Urban was recording. You're going to fly. My yes, first, that's right. My first hit at your place. That's right. And he did I, do that one here. Didn't he? Yeah. And I it was right after the flood and I showed up with it, one of my telecasters thinking that Keith Urban, cause all his stuff had gotten <laughs> wet. I showed yep. up with a telecaster, telecaster thinking that Keith Urban didn't have a guitar. <laughs> so but he did. He ridiculous. didn't, he didn't because yeah. he, he had some TV, a TV thing that he did that night for a benefit with him and Vince Gill. And he, he borrowed my guild. He's, he was out. He's like, can I take this guild? And I'm like, well, yeah, you can, but can we get you a better guitar than that to, to take down there? I think he yeah. lost a lot of guitars in the flood. He did. But yeah. So the first time we met was that, I think that was that day. And then, um, so I was in a band called American bang on Warner brothers yeah. signed out of LA. And that day I gave Keith, the um american bang record and you know at that point you you're just it's i was in my t early 20s i'm chasing everything that's cool you know whether it's whatever you know white stripes or whatever didn't have my own vibe i think when i got some songwriting success it it made me a lot more confident and um you know made me kind of want to stand out and be different than the normal thing you know so that right you know success successful will do that sometimes yeah yeah, I think it's I think it's really good because I think a lot of times to their own detriment bands can get into the game of uh you know the promotion guys like we don't have a single, you know, we need to do something more commercial, whatever that means. Yeah. Which you know really never ever works. You know, it's like I've, I I it seems to work better when people really go for it. So your last record, you you reference this, so I'm going to go ahead and get into it. Tabasco and Sweet Tea, right? Mm -hmm. Unbelievable, man. I love oh, that you. record. I thank flip you, and love everybody listening to this. Go download or stream or whatever you do. Do it on that. What the drums, man, those dry 70s drums. I just love, I love every, I love the guitars. Um, the I love everything about it. I think it's genius. Did you produce it, that man. project? Did you produce that or how did you? Yeah, I actually produced it and mixed it. Um, is the first thing I've attempted at mixing, which is interesting and a real headache, especially when it comes down to turning in all the files to the label. <laughs> I had no idea what I was in for there. <laughs> yeah. You got to hire somebody to do that. That's crazy. Yeah. That, that, that whole, all, well, you know, plus they have all their part requirements. They won't there. You do, you're not, you got to get all that stuff in before you can even, I don't even want to be crass, yeah. but you can't even get, paid that was a mistake. Until, you got yeah, to, I, mistake. <laughs> yeah, there's, um, it's unbelievable what they require of, you know, all the mixes and all the mix minuses, the, all the stuff. It's nuts. What? So I did not know you mixed it too, man. It's, it's, it's fabulous. Thank what you, man. You, I'll tell you that, no. that you, you mentioned the guitars and the drums. It's like, did you ever listen to that band? Um, Cake? Yes. Yeah, he's going the distance. He's going the distance. Uh, that's that's exactly what it uh, reminds me of. So that band was a huge influence when I was a kid and, if you listen to their guitars, they're all like, it's like super direct. 
and yeah. like just line in and just see what you get, you know, depending on the guitar. And I used all those old, like these old fifties harmony rockets and man, it was just, it started, we started that record last year actually on the bus and it just kind of morphed into this thing. And I was just like, I'd play it for people. And then I finally played it for Scott Bruschetta and he was like, dude, I'm two songs in and I cannot believe this. And I was just like, Oh, cool, man. Okay. Cause I thought he was going to be like, Jaron, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> this isn't, this isn't going to work, <laughs> but he really is way more adventurous than people would think. You know what? He is. He really he is. is. I could, I couldn't get off that label if I wanted to, I'm telling you. And that's what's because we stick out like a sore thumb and but me and Scott have become, you know, like extremely good friends and he kind of just lets us run. I mean, we put out 28 songs in a six month period, you know, in a pandemic. So yeah. it's, if you think about it, he's, it's pretty adventurous and it's pretty like, it's pretty cool, man. We get to be his Motley crew, and I think, we get to be on the a big label and have our freedom. So it's, it's a really good partnership. Yeah. I've, uh, through the years I've worked with Scott on things and always been surprised that he is, he's very, you know, because he's, he's been involved with such big commercial projects, but man, he, he really, he'll really go for it. He really doesn't, yeah. he does not like boundaries and you can, and you can't do this sort of thing. And um, he's always, he's, he's impressive guy. Yeah. So, your influences on that record were cake. I I also hear like early ZZ Top in yeah, there. Tower of Power, a lot of Tower, Tower of Power, Power, some funk stuff too, and um, it's some of my, I think it's probably my favorite stuff y'all have done for that for that group. Um, well, I appreciate it. I think it's my favorite too because it was it's just so different. I I mean the thing is about a record like that is I just man you get so sick of, I mean, you're in this, you're in this world that we're down here constantly trying to one, four, five, one, four, five. That's not, mm -hmm. there's a the truck, there's a the girl, there's a the dog, there's a the baby. You know what I mean? Whatever. Mm -hmm. There's the beer. Yep. It's like, I just like, even if the, you know, the topics aren't too far from the middle, but the music sounds different and makes me feel something different. I hadn't heard that in, at least in Nashville. You know what I mean? No, you had, no. Thomas, you know, you had Thomas Rhett kind of go down the Bruno Mars thing a couple of years ago down that alley. You know what I mean? Which he's, he's great at. He did a good job at that. But then he pulled it right back to country. Um, I hadn't heard anybody do Tower of Power meets ZZ Top meets Garth Brooks lyrically, mm -hmm. you know, or, or whatever. So that's kind of what I was shooting for, something different. Well, and it's just so great. That track, Devil's Lettuce, man, that's, that's awesome. Just the little stops in there and... I don't know. It just, it sounds inspired. I love things that are inspired. I bet, I bet y'all fans, that, I bet your fans love that record. I bet they yeah. Do. They wish that we could come play it for them. <laughs> well, man, we gotta be, <clears throat> seems like there's some good news out there with the, I was watching the news last night, some, you know, case not knocking wood, knocking wood, but maybe, maybe by fall, do you think you guys will be yeah. out touring again by fall? That's the, that's the consensus. You know, we kind of, I think we've kind of moved everything um for the summer just because and there might be a few festivals that play but we just have to decide if we're going to do it you know if we feel comfortable mm -hmm. depending on the vaccines and all that stuff but like i think we're scheduled to start back up and um and pretty heavy in august so oh uh, heck it'll be here before you know it i well, can't believe that isn't that wild it is it really it really is um it has been the strangest year ever and it, in some ways to me it has dragged on and on and then in other ways, it's like, wow, it's almost March. It's almost been a year since all this bullshit started. I told my wife yesterday, I was like, man, it'll be it'll be Christmas before we, <laughs> we know it. And we'll be back down in Florida. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's just like. Shoo -shoo. Well, I have another question. I remember when you came over and wrote with uh, Amy and I, and you talked, um, you talked about your dad. Your dad's a musician, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, drummer, played at the Grand... Played a was he the house guy at Grand Old Opry when I first met? Yeah, him? Is that right. He, I think he might have still been the house guy. I don't, I don't really remember. Um, yeah. But he did that for probably. I think he was the house guy for maybe ten years, maybe not quite that long. But um, he, they, my parents moved to Nashville, pregnant with me in 1980, from Louisiana, and Dad was in a band on Warner Brothers called um, Bandana with Lonnie Wilson. That's and right. Okay, Tim Menzies. Yeah. Um, 
And so that's kind of, you know, I was pretty much born into all this stuff. And he did, you know, he did that for years and did the play with uh, Linda Davis forever. A little bit of Reba, a little bit of Mark Chestnut, and then everybody at the Opry. And um, then he started pitching songs, you know, and all this stuff. You know, so he's kind of, I kind of grew up in the whole thing. Yeah, you are, you are uh, Nashville born and raised. And Bandana, now... Uh, Lonnie Wilson was the lead singer of Bandana, right? And your dad was a yep. drummer. Yep. Later, Lonnie Wilson became like top call drum drummer. He was a drummer too. A great yeah, Lonnie and a, a great and a songwriter. He wrote that corn yeah. makes whiskey with yeah. Luke. <laughs> yeah, it's really crazy. Um, so you and now I'm friends with his son Dallas Wilson, which is completely random. But he comes up to me at a studio in a studio one day. I was producing uh, Kelly Bannon. And he comes in with Claire, Tom Douglas's daughter. And yeah. they had written the song that we were cutting on Kelly. And he goes, Hey man, I, I'm Dallas. I think our dads are friends. And I go, what's your last name, man? He goes, Wilson. And I go, who's your dad? <laughs> and he goes, Lon Lonnie Wilson. And I go, Oh man, that's crazy. And so it's just like full circle, you know, it's pretty wild. Yeah. Now, do you, do you, I saw on your uh, resume that you're doing, do you like production? Obviously you're great at it. I mean, your record and like, you know, that I've heard a couple of things you wrote with Amy and then I worked with you on a couple of things. You're, you're, even your demos are amazing. Um, oh, I appreciate it, man. Do you, do you um, like production? Is that something you see yourself doing for a while? Yeah, I do it. I'm, it's, you know, you know how it is. It's very, yeah. it's a labor. It's a lot of work, you know, but I think I only kind of do the, like, I'm kind of like nitpicky just because it's, you, I realize how much work I put into it. And it's, you know, once we go, say we go cut with a band or something, I still bring it home and put it in my little world for God knows how long. And it's, it's just a lot of um, hours, but I do like it. If the project's right, like I'm doing Sam Williams right now, I, it's Hank, Hank Williams Jr.'s kid. And he's different and really cool. And I'm intrigued. You know what I mean? Right. But it's like, uh, and I just finished Drake White's new thing and he's different and he's cool. And I'm yep. intrigued, you know, it's like, I like stuff like that, but I, I do really like it. Um, you know, we'll see. I, I do, I do as many records as I can, but you know, with songwriting and being a dad and a husband and a band, it kind of gets, it's, yeah. uh, it's hectic, you know? Well, and it seems like it would have to be something you're passionate about to, to be worth. Cause it is, a, it is a lot of work and it's a lot of time. Yeah. Um, I'm going down my, uh, I saw devil's lettuce again. That, that song made me laugh, man. <laughs> that, we got that's one of my papers now. We uh, have rolling papers that are tied out that say devil's lettuce. Yeah. Is that cool. part of your merch when you go back? Yeah. Out? I, I got them in the mail the other day and I was like, what the hell? And I called my manager and he said, yeah, we're selling those. And I was like, man, that's a great idea. <laughs> that is a great idea. Well, I just love that you guys are swinging for the fences with that. I really do. I mean, there's so many people playing it safe, and I just think it's such a bad idea. Even you know, yeah. I just think it's such a bad idea to 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 play it safe. It's people respond to real to real stuff. I just figure if radio ain't gonna play us, I might as well go <laughs> get nutty. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and you probably had the experience a lot of people have where they kind of swing for the fence and it and it works. You know, right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Pitch list will be right back. Hey everybody, I want to take a minute and talk about something that probably everyone in the music industry has dealt with at one point or another, and that's our mental health. Our sponsor, BetterHelp, can get you connected to your own licensed professional therapist in a safe, affordable online environment. If something is interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals, it's time to take the first step toward a healthier and happier life. I'm sure you've figured out by now that the music business is extremely challenging and can be a serious strain on your mental health. On a personal note, I don't know where I would be without the counselors who've helped Amy and I throughout the years. Better help will assess your needs and get you communicating with your counselor in under 48 hours. You'll be able to send a message to your counselor anytime and get timely and thoughtful responses. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. 
all from the comfort of your own home. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash songwriter. Betterhelp.com slash songwriter. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash songwriter. Do you pitch any of your songs? Do your pluggers do most of your pitching? Do your relationships? How, how does that work for you? It's interesting, Chris. <laughs> you know, it's like, I think it's probably very, you know, it's like, if I think something is really good uh-huh. or it or really fits Jake, let's just use Jake Owen for an All example. Right. I will send it to Jake. I'll just text it to him or whatever. Um, same with Keith. Same with McGraw. Um, a lot of times, though, man, you just – you want to get – like, I want to get Rusty and them over at Sony, my publishers. I want to get their opinion, too. You know, like, I want to let them do their job and tell me, wait, before you go to McGraw, let's go to – Michael Ray, I don't know, you know, right? Or maybe it's who, maybe it's who's cutting next or whatever. Um, and so I do, a, I'll do a lot of pitching. Man, I would, I will sit down here and drink wine um, after Jude goes to sleep, and that's usually when I get some good pitches in because you're just sitting there, you start thinking out of the box a little bit, and you get mm-hmm. a little liquid courage in you. You're like, screw it, man, I'll send it to him. Right. <laughs> hey, Dirk. right. Hey, Dirks, are you up? (laughs) (laughs) But uh, yeah, I do a lot. I do a lot of the pitching. um, But yeah. I think it's good for writers to pitch because I think sometimes, believe it or not, I think pluggers can be too hesitant. You know, they have these complicated relationships they're trying to maintain and they don't want to, you know, pitch the wrong thing or pitch a song that doesn't work. And yeah. I find, or they're pitching to, there's a layer removed from the artist. They're pitching to a producer or an A&R person or a manager. I've, it's, boy, if you can get straight to the artist, I think it's way better, you know? It, you know, it's funny, man. It's, I agree with that. It's, I mean, that's an obvious thing. Too, it is, you know, but, like but it's, right. but, and, and anybody who could get to an artist would, but I think it's worth saying it's like, uh, I, I'm just asking, but I find artists way more forgiving and interesting and so than they than the people who listen for them. Oh, dude, most people who listen to them are assholes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like just, you I'm can kidding, pitch them because most of them are really nice people, no. but it, they're not. Yeah, no, but they're hard on songs. They're not. I. That's what I'm saying. Like you can go in a pitch meeting for someone's A and R person. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. And then you play it for the artist. They're like, yeah, man, I like that. I'll live with that. You know. Now they might be being polite sometimes, but. Yeah, that's the hard thing about. I can't imagine being a publisher. I mean, I am a publisher actually. I have three writers, but I don't ever go into pitch meetings. But I can't imagine going into someone's office with your your heart in a little box and be like, "Remember the old days with the dats or like you yeah. walk in with a cassette tape or whatever." You're just like, I can't imagine being like. And they listen to the first verse and they're like, ah, I pass. I'm like, what the hell, man! I spent <laughs> I spent yeah. so much time on this. Like that would be so hard. I agree and. Uh, somebody told me one time about pitching your songs, writing your songs. They're like, you can't take it personal. And I remember looking at them and thinking, it don't get any more personal. This is what's more personal than a song. Yeah. We're right. I, I mean, I, I just opened a vein up on this tape and they're saying, don't take it personal. It's very difficult. I think it's great to have somebody like rusty or his staff. Now, did you go with rusty to Sony or were you there before? Man, I have been. Um, you remember famous music with uh, yeah. Glenn Middleworth, Curtis Green? Yeah. So I, they, they signed me in 2005 over there. Sony bought Famous in 2006, I think, or seven. I came over, me and Tony Lane and mm-hmm. a handful of writers came over to Sony. I've been there pretty much every since. I've every since. Um, I just did a uh, extension last year, so I'm still so there. Since, since 2005, is that right? So ten. Yeah. Wow, long time. And then Tom, of course, Tom's Douglas has been over there for over. I know he's over twenty because I remember at the holiday brunch he got like a an award, and I was I was about to my my contract was up, and I said, "Shit, man, maybe I'll stay. That looks pretty cool." Yeah, <laughs> I like to get that yeah. 20, 20 year. So, do you do a lot of your co writing that strictly songwriting co writing? Do you write with an artist most of the time? 
So I would say I write four days a week, usually sometimes five, but I try to take Fridays off so I can get that three day weekend in. But um, especially if we're at the beach, but I would say, you know, probably two days a week are usually set aside for an artist if we can. And if we can't, then I'll hit, you know, you know, sometimes like, like yesterday I was booked with uh, Travis Denning and Mark Irwin and Travis canceled. And so I called Mark and said, Hey, I need to catch up on some stuff. So I caught up on stuff, but I ended up writing that afternoon with Zach Kill because he had something that was open and we were writing for Michael Bublé. And it was just like, you just, it's kind of a free for all these days. Cause all it takes to get in a songwriting session is just like, okay, I'm here. What do you got? Yeah. You know what, what I mean? Got? Yeah. Well, talk to me about the future for you. I mean, you, you you've kind of got the whole, I, I'm knocking wood. I don't want to jinx you, but you've, you've got it going on, man. You've got a killer cool band making crazy great records and touring. And you also have just this on fire songwriting career in which you can buy multiple beach homes um you're kind of having your cake and eating it too how uh how do you see the future for you just keep on keeping on the way you're doing are there are there other dreams for you coming up uh career-wise yeah, i mean kind of in it what talk to me about it um you know I, I think there's gonna be a lot more producing stuff coming up probably going to jump into an anr situation um partner with a label before long kind of in the mm -hmm. works um, and that will lead to a lot of production stuff, I think. And eventually, I think down the road, I would like to have my own situation, my own label, and, and whether it's an imprint or something or whatever, you know. And it, it kind of similar to what, remember what Luke Lewis did back in the Lost Highway days? You know, that, that whole mindset and that whole vibe is missing, I think, in Nashville right now. Um, and I'd like to do something like that. I think it'd be well, really cool. Talk about, talk about that vibe. You mean an imprint label that sort of specializes on alt country or what? What yeah. exactly? Like just whatever that is. Like, you know what I mean? Like you could, we could have anybody from a Tucker Bethard to that still kind of could work at radio. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, to our band, great example. Um, you know, to Sam, Sam Williams is a great example for that kind yep. of thing. And I mean, I'm talking like full promotion team too, you know, like we're not just gonna, you know, get not work radio. You know what I mean? I think you, you develop a situation that you find an artist that, you know, like Lucinda Williams, you know, how, I think she was actually on Lost Highway, Ron Adams, all the, that, that roster mm -hmm. was absolutely rad. You know what I mean? Yep, like it they, was. even all the way down to like Tiff Merritt, I think they had Tiff Merritt. Mm -hmm. It's like, I love that. You know, that was yeah. such a cool, such a cool eclectic roster. And I just yeah. think, and you, you kind of go for, you, yes, you have a promotion team, all that stuff, but you go for the Grammy, you know, and you mm -hmm. do that thing, you know, and you hope you find Stapleton, you know? Yeah. I, as far as like future though, that that's a long ways down the line probably, but. Uh, yeah, I bet, I bet not that long. I mean, Hopefully. Yeah, you're like a you're like a country rock Ryan Tedder, like mogul. You're like a mogul. <laughs> That's right. Well, I hope so. A vibe mogul. Not like yeah. not like crap. You gotta pay for all this shit. I gotta pay for all I, this shit somehow. I understand. <laughs> and you got kids now. You gotta you, you got a kid, yeah. you gotta put through college. Yeah. And you'll need a house in Malibu. You so could you not pay me to live in California, man. <laughs> really? <laughs> no. The weather's I mean, great. The weather's amazing, but I mean, I'm six hours from my beach house from here, you know, door to door, yeah. and yeah. it's weather's pretty similar. And it's the traffic, there's no traffic. I live in this little hippie beach town called Great Beach, and it's, oh, yeah, I know, yeah. I mean, it's I can hit the red bar with a rock, I can hit yeah. the ocean with a rock, so it's like, yeah, no California for this guy. You guys yeah. live out there for a while, didn't you? Well, I lived out there before I came here for five years, and we're Amy and I are talking about going back uh, in August for oh, wow. a little sabbatical, but we're we're not going to sell our place here or anything. I something. love that place, man. That y'all have that's such a great vibe over there. Thank you. And since you're just over, you're just over the highway from us. We could probably yep. throw a rock. You're but you know who lives right between us is Jack White. Oh yeah, man. Funny story about Jack White, and it's really funny because his house is right there. It makes sense now, but. 
when um, we were in American Bang still, or we might have just started Cadillac. I can't remember, but um, me and is when Jack and Brendan were doing the rack and tours thing. Mm-hmm. Me and our guy, our band would meet Brendan because we were all friends with Brendan Benson, and we would meet Brendan and Jack White and the Kings of Leon guys down at um, uh, Lipscomb Elementary where that baseball field is, you know? Yeah, and my kids go to school tr- there, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, so we pull our trucks up, keg of, keg of beer in the back of the truck <laughs> on Sundays, and we would play softball against them. Uh, you know, we'd make teams and everything, and the girls would hang, and it was so much fun, but it was the most comp- – the, the follow guys, and you know, I'm still pretty good friends with Nathan – um, the drummer, he lives down the street from me, but he, this, those guys are super competitive, you know, because they're brothers and they hate each yeah. other or whatever. So yeah. you like, you get them and then you got Jack White who shows up to the first game and he's got white face paint on wearing all black. It's probably 110 degrees outside and he's playing first base and he's just slamming the ball. He's a hell of a baseball player. Like it was, it was such wow. a bizarre thing because we were, we were huge fans, you know, but, but sure. we were just hanging out and playing softball with them. It was cool times. That's a that's a great thing about Nashville. You never know. I used to, um, and my, we I'm a huge fan of his, and my kids are too. And they'll see him in the Target, and they'll go up and say, "Hey!" And I, he doesn't really know to think. You know what I mean? He's he seems right. kind of shy. Um, Kings of Leon being brothers, and aren't one of them cousins, or is that the crew guys? Yeah, Matthews, there? yeah, Matthews a cousin. And Nacho's could, a cousin too. He's a crew guy. Yeah. So you can imagine growing up, you know, my brother and I fought until I left home. I mean, my, my, like fist fought, you know what I mean? It's pretty common. Yeah. Um, apparently they would have knocked down, I mean, like get stitches fights in Blackbird when Angelo was making that record. I mean, yeah. like, dude, me and me and Caleb kind of back in the day, like he's kind of I think, you know, there's an aggressive thing about those guys you know and a- angelo one of my dear friends you know he he would we would talk about them and because we were always so like god how did they get so big so quick how yeah. did they yeah. you know and just like and i hated that i hated that <laughs> and so um there, there was always this little rub now nathan's sweet as can be he's always been really cool and the other guy they're all great now because we're all grown-ass men but they were yeah. like uh, there was a time it was kind of like god these guys are they think they're, I don't know if they think they're too cool for school or I'm just jealous of them being so big that there's this rift. <laughs> I, I do remember, I started hearing stories about how uh, these two kids are in a band uh, uh, and they're selling out Wembley Stadium. You know, this is coming from, I mean, our band's fair, you know, we're pretty damn big in, in the UK and in Europe, like uh, selling out big places and it's Mm -hmm. i can't imagine it but we built it over six years you know what i mean right going back every year two times a year um we played for like eighty thousand people last year down download fest opening for aerosmith and it's crazy now imagine those guys not having to build that thing and just getting on right right oh we're big (laughs) yeah which is right it was out of nowhere to the point where i didn't even believe it the first time i heard it you guys are a steady thing all the way from American Bang. I mean, really. And then right. it was Cadillac Black, right? Yeah. And then Cadillac 3. But And you guys did a live record from there, right? We did. We did it live from Abbey Road, man. And yeah. I'll tell you what, that was one of the craziest days ever. The night before that, we were heading back from a bar. We played a, I don't know, like a, a fan club show or something. We were walking back to the hotel. Why we took didn't take a car, I don't know. Why our tour manager didn't get us in the car i don't know but we got into a all-out street brawl in the middle of this neighborhood in london and really hotel. oh and just got i mean got after it and our tour manager had his jaw broken and why you know everything i mean we're just fighting Damn. in the middle of the road fighting for your life at 2 a.m in the morning and it was just absolutely bonkers so we get back to the hotel and tour manager goes to the hospital he's all messed up you know and next, we had to be at Abbey Road at like six or seven that next morning to get everything ready so we could film it, you know, and everything and and record it. And I mean, that whole day, man, we're just out there. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> just hurting, just hurting, man, you know. Uh, but it was a really wow. cool experience. Have you been to Abbey Road? I have. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty it's, magical place. It is pretty magical place. 
It's it's just like you kind of just stand in front of it and go, this is where this is it. Abbey yeah, Road. This is where it happened. This is where it happened. What who were you guys fighting with? Just were there just bar fights? Two guys, two or two or three guys jumped out of um an alley or something and just started swinging. Damn. And we were just walking. We were just walking, you know. Um were you guys yeah, famous was, there at that point? It was I mean, yeah, it was getting pretty big at that point. What do you think it is about Europe or especially um UK? They seem they just seem more into root stuff, don't they? Is that Dude, there's a huge thing right now for southern music in general. Like Americana's doing really good over there. Country like straight up country. Like we went over there and right before the pandemic last year, we we hadn't done the C to C festival on purpose for the first couple of years just because we built our own thing over there. And why go open for Luke Combs when we can do the same amount of tickets and have it be our own show. You right. know what I mean? Um, and so we went over there and it was pretty amazing to see like um, the, the, the country crowd, you know what I mean? Like in, in Amsterdam, you know what I mean? You're, you're playing a small arena in Amsterdam and you're like, geez, I mean, Amsterdam is a weird place to play. Even for us still to the, to this day, we're pretty big there, but the shows are always weird. Everybody's just kind of just like taking it in and you're like, are they on drugs? I don't know what's going on. Am I am I doing am I on drugs? <laughs> you know? They could be. So a, Do they come out in cowboy hats and cowboy boots and all this stuff? Yeah. And I will say, like in the UK especially, oh well, actually all over, like Germany and all that stuff. Um, literally people people will show up to the shows and our buses will be usually you have to park right out front of the venue just because there's nowhere to go, you know? Mm -hmm. And so we're just kind of huddled up on the buses, like trying mm -hmm. to stay away from people, but they'll show up and you see the lines and it's like half the people are dressed up like us. Like they'll have the long hair with the, the trucker cap, you know, and everything. Right. Um, and the same kind of shirts and everything, leather jackets. And it's really funny because and you'll do a meet and greet and it's like, they, they're so in they're they're like enamored and they're like, ah, Jaren, Jaren. Ah, oh my goodness. You know, ah, oh, can I have your hat? <laughs> like, no, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun over there, man. So do you tour in a bus around there? It's a smaller bus that they use, right? It's long. It's uh, higher. So it's a double decker. Oh, okay. So the last couple that we've had have been double deckers and they, um, it's, it's really cool. It's, it's, um, you know, bunk alley upstairs. Oh, wow. All okay. the way, like all the way. So like 16 bunks, which is crazy. And their front lounge in the front above the driver and a back lounge in the back. And then you have downstairs, you have a kitchen and a hangout area and TVs that goes to the driver thing. It's really, it's pretty cool. I've, I've never seen one of those. I might check it out online. That sounds way better. Yeah. It's cool, man. I can't imagine anything more cool than touring Europe. I love it over there. It's just so beautiful. It's so interesting. People are great. Dude, the coolest part about it is those buses. You can, you know, sit in that front lounge area where it's just all one huge window all the way mm -hmm. around above the driver. You can sit there going through Scotland and everything. I mean, Germany and all. You can see everything. And I remember when we were the first time we went into like Norway or something like, yeah, it was Oslo. And you come down over that hill and you see it's like a movie and it's mm -hmm. just it was like a James Bond movie and you're just kind of watching it and you're like, this is wild. And then you get there and you go play a show for a couple hundred people that, you know, you that don't barely speak English, but love everything you're saying. And it's, it's just a bizarre thing. I'll tell you one thing in Oslo, man, you better bring your wallet with you because I took the guys to an Indian restaurant one night there. And I was just thinking, you know, you can't, I can't read the, the translation of the money, you know, whatever it is. It's right. just like it says, a gajillion rubles yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. And so I was like, ah, it's probably not that bad. I don't care. I do all right. I can take, I can take it right in. I spent like $8,000. <laughs> you are kidding. Indian How dinner. many people? No, it was just the band and crew. So it was probably eight of us, you know? And I mean, we get to drinking Damn. pretty good. So that's probably yeah. what it was. But I, was I thought you were going to say 1500 Yeah. That's I mean, a lot. it probably was like that. It probably was more like 15 or two grand, but it felt like eight at the time. Yeah. I think it's, I think you're living the life O'Reilly, man. I think you've got it completely figured out. And I tell you what, I appreciate it. You are so talented and you couldn't be a nicer guy. Um, I'm, I'm just happy to have, uh, to know you and 
where I know everyone out there listening is loving to hear all your stories, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to turn you, you loose. How's it? Tell Amy I said hi and tell her I love her. She's good people too. I will do it. Same to your family. And man, thank you so much for being on our podcast. Thank you so much. It's been right, awesome. Man. Thank you, Jaron. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Take care, buddy. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Pitch List, produced in partnership with the American Songwriter Podcast Network. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe to us on Apple Podcast or your preferred listening platform. And if you want, feel free to leave us a five-star rating and review. For exclusive content from this week's guest and more, you can visit our website at pitchlistpodcast.com or follow our social media pages on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. To hear songs written and or recorded by today's guest, check out this week's playlist by finding us on Spotify at Pitch List Podcast. Plus, don't forget to let us know on social media what songwriter, musician, or music business professional you want to hear from next. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time. I'm in the Cadillac 3. I don't give a shit.